So, I said to Bongani, I don't get, I mean, I get excited about every guest I talk to on the Hanging Out feature. Um, but I've been looking forward to this conversation for the longest of times. Um, and I'm really extremely excited this morning. I couldn't even eat um, because I was looking forward to hanging out uh, with John Kani, who is in studio with us this morning. You know, sometimes we use the word legend lightly. You know, it's easy to call people, oh, yeah, he's a legend, she's a living legend. Um, but this person really is a legend in the word's truest form. Um, and I'm so grateful, uh, Mr. Kani, that you have come to spend an hour with us in studio. Thank you for making time. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for not forgetting living legend. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yes, right. <laughs> so it, you are very much a living great. legend. It does indicate that I'm still alive. <laughs> yes. You, you got into the studio and you said to Abel, show sure, man. I was like, Abel, Abel. says so someone who turned 80 <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> telling someone who's what, just plus 30, Hrot man. You look so good. What are you doing? What are you eating? What the wife puts in front of me. Uh, okay. I have no choice. Do you no, cook yourself or? No, yeah. I'm not very good in eating. Yeah. Really, I eat because I haven't eaten. I don't get hungry. I could watch. I, I'm calculating in my mind. Hey, I hadn't had breakfast. Yeah. It's now 12 o'clock. Yeah. Hey, it's now 4 o'clock. I haven't yeah. had anything to eat today. And then I quickly make a salad. Or my, my wife is always there. Yeah. to we, we, Together, we make something and we eat. Do you run? Do you exercise? You can't I'm have a body years like old. that. You want me to go somewhere five kilometers that way only to get back where I started? <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> I mean, I, I, do you just have good genes? I think it's good genes. My grandfather died at 101. My grandmother at 106. Wow. In my line, there's longevity. Yeah. And um, look, I, much as I can, I walk. Mm -hmm. I walk to areas that I could go to. My sons, you know, I've got four sons and three daughters. My sons always say, Dad, let's walk. I said, mm -hmm. where are we going? He says, we're going to walk for about three kilometers that way and then come back. I says, I'm here already. <laughs> <laughs> DRP. DRP. So my producers said, they said to me, stay away from Kosa. Because well, I'm fascinated by this car. Like, hey, I'm going to go to the car. 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 I'm have you lost count? I'm sure. Yes, you I have. don't have over twenty. Over twenty. And I'm still alive. And you're still here. <laughs> Lifetime achievement award. I don't they're just there. Mm. And when For you everything. There was a time you received a Tony. Um what, when when was that? Nineteen seventy five. Nineteen seventy five. Seventy five. That was a groundbreaking moment. What did that mean for you? You know, coming from South Africa as an actor, working around New Brighton, <laughs> Johannesburg, went to London in 1973 to open with uh, Cesar Banzi is Dead with mm -hmm. Winston Jonah, directed by Arthur Fugard. We opened at the, at, uh, the Royal Court Theatre. And that evening, you know, when there's a, an opening night, everybody's kind of tense, you know, mm -hmm. check this, check this, check this. We heard that there were a couple of people who would like to see us after the show. But the people were telling us, like, if you don't want to see them, it's okay. They are from the, you know, the refugees and all that. Uh. I'm thinking, I say no. I don't know who those people are. Uh. So at the end of the performance of Cesar Vans is Dead, and it was O.R. Tambo, Adelaide Tambo, Robert Khesha, I mean, all the big guns. Yeah. I've only read about them. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen them. And they says one wonderful work. And I remember O.R. saying, what you did in 90 minutes tonight mm. is what we've been trying so hard to convince these British people about the inhumanity of apartheid. Wow. So we transferred to the West End. My eyes are open. The theater sits 1,200. The tickets are 120 pounds sold out. You think how Fondine Kai and his five rand, man. I saw God in food, man. I, I'm a combs, <laughs> galog, man. Yeah. How many combs can you give? Yeah. So we then arrive in New York and we open on Broadway. My God. 
didn't really know what a Tony Award is. Truly, we didn't know. It was just being nominated. All I noticed after nomination, the bookings jumped by another three months. And of course, the bank account. Don't talk about that. <laughs> There another like zero at the end, another zero. <laughs> so the night of the open or of the Tony Award, yeah. we're sitting at the Winter Garden Center, um, Angela Lansbury, uh, who she wrote, is one of the nominees as well. Alan mm. Bernstein is a nominee. Anthony Hopkins is a nominee for Best Actor. Rex and uh, Ben Gazzara. And Winston and I are nominated on different levels. So I don't know whether I'm nominated for Cesar Barnes is dead and he's nominated for the island or the way other round. Yeah. And then Walter Mutau with Mary Stapleton and Meryl Streep, they go on stage. Look at these names I'm dropping. I mean, you just said Meryl <laughs> Streep, like, and you just continued, like nothing just happened. Yeah. And they say, there was, of course, you know, in, in on Broadway, there's like the betting. Yeah. Uh, Peter Firth. He did Echoes, uh, brilliant actor. He was like 14 to 10 to win Best Actor uh, for, for as an, a, a, in a Tony Award Best Actor. So when they get all the nominees are Peter Firth, Ben Gazzara, Anthony Hopkins, Labarro John Kenai, mm -hmm. John Kenai, Winston and Shona, as an old and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then says the winner is, and this guy next to me, because you sit on the aisle when you're nominated so that you can get out quicker. Yeah. And the cameras are not on us, on Peter Firth, yeah. to take him up as he goes to receive the Tony. Ah. And, then and then, boom, Meryl says, oh my God, the winners are John Kainai oh and Winston and John, and he sat down on camera. <laughs> so now we're walking up there, and I'm thinking, she's out in town. There's no speech. We had a performance at, 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 at uh, three o'clock that day. Yeah on a Sunday. So we get there. I pick up my Tony Award and I say, thank you. And Winston says, thanks. So we walk off. We didn't say, I thank my mother. I thank Jesus. I thank my creator. I thank my agent. We didn't. Wow. We just said, thank you and thanks. Tomorrow morning, following the Clive Barnes on the, or on the New York Times, says that silence was the most potent political statement against a system of government abhorrent. Ab we didn't say that. Now, I come back from South Africa with a Tony Award. I get detained immediately by <laughs> silence. And yeah. I keep saying to the security guy, yeah. and it, it's, it's not what I said. Yeah. He said, he has it on the paper. Yeah. I said, yes, I know it's on the paper. It's a journalist who wrote that. Yeah. I didn't write that. That's that man's opinion. So. 23 days, Winston and I were in solitary confinement. And after 20, on the 20th day, actually, a little piece of paper slid under the cell door. You know, that nonsense about great escape. <laughs> when that cell door closed, yeah. it goes, Clement, you're not going to get out of this cell. Forget about it. Be comfortable. There's no escape. The door is this thick, about six inches thick. Mm. And... This piece of paper lies there. I watched it for about an hour or an hour and a half because I don't want to be trapped picking it up. I don't know what it is. Mm. So, but slowly I opened it, slowly. There it is, Actors on Broadway, March for the release of John Carney and Winston John. Wow. The president is asked to intervene. London, all, all the great actors are standing in Trafalgar Square in front of the South Africa house. I fell asleep. Immediately. Mm. I hadn't slept all that time because now I know they can't kill me. Yeah. The world knows they have me. Yeah. And I just laid back, fell asleep. Uh, what did that inspire you to do um, as an artist? That apartheid regime, how did it influence and inspire you as an artist? It first inspires me, that regime, as a young man growing up in New Brighton knowing, seeing the movement. It was exciting, man. Uh, like, the, 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 there are guys as Aziwa, you know, mm. the, 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 that they're dangerous, these people. And they're all underground. Mm. We knew this African National Congress, underground operatives. So we used to go to two schools a day. In the morning at 8 to 2, I'm at the Upper United at New Brighton School. Mm. And from 3 o'clock, we go to an empty space where Usi Spiriti, who's a commissar, teaches us 
the underground politics. Mm. She was this big woman, but as soon as the police van stops, she jumps the fence better than us mm. on the other side. <laughs> so then when you then grow up, you grow with this feeling of, uh, it's a wooer. Mm. We will be free one day. Mm. And all that our parents trying best they can to keep that talk out of our minds, out of our ears, just to live, go to school, go to church, clean the yard, <laughs> the dogs. If you get an education, you have a future. You must study hard. If you go to church, God is on your side. You know, mm. all those things. Yeah. But then there's this other undercurrent about the struggle. In Cape, especially that area as in New Brighton in Port Elizabeth. So then in 1965, I then st start my career as an actor and as a writer. But before that, it was at school. Mm -hmm. In every play at school I'm in, in everything, it began to bite this thing. So that political education fusing mm -hmm. with the arts of theater, and I realized, my God. This is powerful. It's powerful. We can use this thing called theater. Mm. We can use this thing sto called storytelling. But this is, could be a voice, you know. Mm. And the one thing that's in 1965, where I did Antigone by Sophocles, and the play was about, I mean, if the law is unjust, the people have a right to oppose it and to fight it. Mm. But I grew up in a country that says the law is right. The law is the law. Mm. You were told, that's the law. When I said to my father, why can't we do that? So he would say, it's the law. Mm. Meaning that you can't challenge it. And meaning that it's like God ordained, it's the law. But this play said, if the law is unjust, Go you have a right it. to challenge so it. So what was the transition then? Because then apartheid comes to an end. I mean, the remnants are still there. Um, the lives are not incredibly changing. So w what role did you have then, or did you feel you had as an artist? Um, what happens to protest theater and using the arts as this powerful weapon to speak against this power? Well, we suddenly didn't have a war. Mm. I lost the target. <laughs> My art was, like, was geared to opposing the apartheid system, revealing or unearthing the injustices, the inhumane treatment of black people, the past laws, the everything that was part of that apartheid system, Group Areas Act, Influx mm. Control, all the plays we'd written before, the Osses, the Banzi, My Children, My Africa, Blood mm. Note and all, we're dealing with that. Now, 1994, we suddenly wake up with the scripts about Viva <laughs> South Africa, release Mandela, he, he's talking, he's president. Yeah. <laughs> he's president, Let, let's get our freedom, no, yeah. you free, yeah. now let's blame the white man, no, <laughs> now you part of the problem yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So for a moment there was sort of a lull in our creative yeah. sort of spirits, what are we going to talk about, what are you going to write? But as an artist and as a, as a writer, slowly the ideas begin to make you see and you realize Hold it, hold it. I went to vote. I was mm. 57 years old, and I lived in this house. Now, I did vote. Mandela's president, how the hell do I come back to the same house in the township? Mm. No, no, the, this is not what I thought freedom would mean. I remember telling the late Helen Susman that when we are free, we swap houses. You go to Soweto, I go to Houghton. Mm. And she said, oh, no, John. You left to fight because I worked for this house. Mm. I said, but I was one working for you to work for this house. Yeah. We used to have a joke with her. She used yeah. to help me a lot when I had problems with my passport and traveling abroad. So that was the other thing that we needed now to look at. But what gave us something to do immediately was 1995, the Truth and Reconciliation. So we did a lot of workshops working through our communities about what does reconciliation mean. Mm. And that's when I wrote Nothing But <laughs> It is the result of that search about what do you understand about forgiving. And one of the things that was st st what sort of was uh, stuck in my mind is that who was organizing the reconciliation mm. commission? Mm. We did. We had organized to ask them people who wronged us in the past to come and ask us to forgive them when they actually did not necessarily want to mm. come mm. and to be to mm. ask to be mm. And my point was simply first, tell me what you've done so that I could then forgive you. Yeah. You can't say, 
forgive me. Yeah. And so that's when then our work began to look at that, you know, and other issues, of course, that were uh, the poverty issue, mm. the issue of the African family structure, the issue of the violence within our own community. And then that violence then was just in the community. Mm. Now, today, that violence is in the house. We used to see there, like, hey, what's going on there? He's fighting with the girlfriend. I stop that. What's happening there? That husband is fighting with the wife. You could hear the shouting. Mm. Stop that. Now it's moved inside. Yeah. It's in the house, the violence. I cannot believe how relevant nothing but the truth still is today. I mean, I watched it and I was blown away. Um, I've watched Kunene and the King. And I mean, you never disappoint, <laughs> Mr. Kani. I actually hosted, um, is it Michael Richard? Michael Richard, yes. Yes, Michael Richard recently, a, a couple of months ago on the show as, as well, when we were talking about just a, a, a theater and, and playwright. How, w when you write today, I mean, you've done solo, you've, write, you've written you know, solo uh, productions, worked on that. Um, what's your focus? Because often when I've watched you on stage, I live with something it's it's almost intentional you're trying to send a message and we when we watched kunene and the king i remember there was a group of um white boys from from some school yes and the thing about that play was it made us i mean there's stuff that you said um that i i, I paused and i thought oh my goodness did he just say that <laughs> but i love that discomfort because we need to have those conversations and we're not having them how intentional are you when you are writing or, or you are delivering on that stage? And what, what message is mostly what you want to send out? You wake up in the morning, you. You try to think in your mind, what's the program going to be today? Mm. How am I going to handle it? What am I trying to engage my community or my listenership with? Do you know that? You, you don't know. The answer doesn't come. Mm. It's when you sit down and suddenly he says, oh, Three, two, one, mm. and you go. Using the muscle memory, using that part of the brain, <laughs> your past experience. You refer to that, looking at your own environment, and already it's a Clement Magnatella show. Mm. And <laughs> by tone, by accent, by content, it is. You can't get out of that. You know, and, and sometimes, let's say you suddenly now uh, commentating on the Springboks playing Scotland, and <laughs> we think, I'm man. What's the claimant doing that? Mm. <laughs> Why is it wrong for yeah. you to comment? Because mm. you're a journalist, you're a, a, a radio personality. When you write, you don't know where you're going with it. The challenge is that blank page. Mm. In your mind, there are these little creatures that has been trying to speak to you, saying, I have an idea, There's a, I could write about this, but you can't put your mind to it. Mm. It's almost a gestation period. <laughs> oh, you chew the card, and then you think, and suddenly, suddenly, like a bolting light, that first line goes on a blank page. Mm. Now, you can't say, <laughs> they called Kunen and the King, it's about, I don't know mm. it's about. All I know is that I've got these two people in one room, mm -hmm. the only love they have is for Shakespeare, mm -hmm. but they come from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're gonna say. It's when I start writing that I start engaging with them, both of them. So I become like schizophrenic. In one moment, I am Lunga from Orlando mm -hmm. with all his mm -hmm. troubles, with mm -hmm. all his problems, <laughs> anger of his past. On the other side, I have Jack, who is a Shakespeare and brilliant South African actor mm -hmm. who did not vote for the National Party very kind to their servants at home, and never was a policeman, so he'd never done anything, didn't even go to the TRC because he had nothing to be forgiven for. Mm. So then, what would bring them together? Then you create that environment. And as you start writing, it's so funny to you because you could pop in in this way and that way. But when I get to a point when my brain says, where I take the story, I stop. Because now John Gunn is interfering on the creative process. Woo! When does it when does it kick in though? So when you are delivering, and you see the reception, is that when you then rationalize and say, Ah, is this what this was about? Because there's a way we respond as um, as an audience. Is that when you realize what the play was about, even though 
and I, 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 may, I wonder if sometimes maybe there was no intention for it to be about that. But as you were delivering it, you realized from the reception that, wow, this is the message actually that went out. Actors normally are afraid of the opening night. It's called the press night because the critics are going to come mm. and people are going to write about it and tell you what the play was about, what they did not like, what they liked about the play. I am scared of the first <laughs> that first night before an audience mm. where we have a few people in the theater. It's called the first preview. Mm. They pay very little. Sometimes they come free because that's when the child is born. That's when I know mm. that this thing works. My heart pounds in my heart, yeah, in my chest because they might boo, they <laughs> might throw tomatoes, they might walk out. It might be the worst thing I've ever written in my life yeah. because you never write a hit. You tell a story. My strength as an actor is that my reference is the truth. And my experience is my living existence. Mm. Therefore, when I've written that play and I go uh, to that stage, the curtain comes up or the lights go on, I'm at home. I'm in a once upon a time. Mm. There was this old woman with 66 children. Once mm. upon a time, yes. there was this old lion. That's for me. Yeah. And when you feel that, that, that communication, when that audience sits like this and say, tell me, all right, let's prove it, John. What Kenny. do you have? And slowly they do this. Slowly yeah. they do this. You can see them. You can yeah. feel them moving forward, leaning forward, leaning like listening and not wanting to miss a bit. Then you know we are in communication. Yeah. Then you sail with them. They become the wind. And then towards the end of the play, and when you think, all right, that's the last word. There's a moment there. It's a hundredth of a second. Nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And suddenly, wow. Standing ovation. Yeah. That's when you know you've written a nice play. A nice play. So movies? Oh, movies or are theater. fantastic. Oh, no, we make money there. So you make money with movies so you can go enjoy yourself doing theater. The, absolutely. Movies are a different kettle of fish. It's a business. It's a very, very big business. Yeah. It's a multi-billion business. So yes, Clement written a story about his life. We're not interested in Clement. We're finding how can we commercialize that and make it accessible to the Idaho housewives yeah. who do nothing but go to the movies every day. Yeah. So then we think, okay, who could play Clement? Nah, John Gunn. No, 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 no. Denzel Washington. Mm. We don't, Denzel doesn't even know Clement. I know Clement, but no, no, Denzel. Because with Denzel, we get 300 million immediately from Warner yeah. Brothers producers or the distributors. Uh -huh. Okay, who works opposite Denzel? John Gunn can be the father. That's fine, that's fine. Uh -huh. He's got a clout. Check his ratings. John Gunn is A or B lister? No, he's A lister. <laughs> Some financial decisions. We put together a budget about this movie. So we say we're doing about, uh, let's say, $250 million movie. So we're going to exploit the entire your life, where you came from, your conflicts, and the father, and all characters. When you arrive on set, there's already a shooting board. Yeah. You know? Well, with Marvel and, and, um, and Disney, you don't see the script. <laughs> you don't. It comes up with a code on your television, on your computer, internet, and you read it, it takes about 45 minutes, it's gone. You won't get another one. And then what must happen? Oh, you. You're an actor. Like, do you do the movie so you can make the money? Yes. So you can do what you love the most, which is theater? Theater, yes. Writing. Mm. Look, when you are cast in a play, let's say we're doing Hamlet or we're doing a new play, you yeah. get the full script, Yeah. right? And even if you have a very small role, you have a less speaking role, not small, yeah. less speaking, speaking role, yeah. not small, because the character is a whole human being. Mm. Therefore, the character cannot be degraded to small because you're speaking less. Yeah. Yeah. So you then have the script, you read the script, right? Same with, and now you get a movie. If the movie is um, you're one of those less speaking, yeah. you are sent only that page, mm. only that page. You have no idea of the other pages, what this thing mm -hmm. is about. Mm -hmm. But you will be briefed by your agent, you'll be briefed by on arrival, by the tech people and the script people, mm -hmm. of what the context of that particular scene is. Mm -hmm. But when you get to our level where we are right through the movie, then you get the entire script. 
Now, it depends which company is. The major companies in Hollywood are threatened by espionage. Is that the story gets leaked before the studios have even completed it. Mm -hmm. It's like in South Africa, <laughs> the movie opens today, but yesterday you were buying the DVD <laughs> at the traffic lights. Yeah, even CDs. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, artists will release an album next week. We, people already have it for some Already have it because the master, <laughs> the, the master one has been going all around. Yeah. So now, especially Marvel and Disney, yeah. they don't do that no okay. more. Okay. So I will then, I'm playing Rafiki or mm. I'm playing King Tichaga or whatever, or I'm playing the Colonel in Murder Mystery. Mm. You're not first, okay, we're sending you our first episode. You got an hour, great. And there it is, the link is, so I print link and it opens. And I read very fast. And I read and I read and I read and I get to the end and I finish it, right. Now I'm thinking, let me read again. If it's within the time limit of the link, I might get half, but it suddenly disappears. And I can't open that link anymore now. It's gone. Mm. Unless I call my agent who calls the uh, producers who releases again. Yeah. But it's not important, Dr. Kani. We just want you to get here. It doesn't matter. So you arrive on set, right? I'm in my hotel. I get nothing. Exactly at 10 p.m. in the evening, mm. I get this, the, the script for tomorrow, for that scene, for tomorrow. Mm. I'm picked up at 5 or 4 or 6 o'clock. We arrive on set. We interact with the actors in that scene. A little bit of a rehearsal, seeing each other, because we already know who we are, really. Yeah. I mean, I step on the scene, and the producer comes down. And says, Ladies and gentlemen, we have, an, uh, we have an elder in the house. This is Dr. John Kenny from South Africa. I started this man when I was still at Yale, and, and everybody, yeah, yeah. And then, cut, get to work. Now, when we finish that scene, and they say, print, the scripts are taken from your hand and shredded. Shredded. And then you'll get the other scripts 10 o'clock this evening. Yeah. So that's how, they, in order to avoid it, things leaking, yeah. there's one I'm doing now, an installment of The Lion King. That's all I can say. It's called confidentiality, cl confidentiality clause. Yeah. We were on set, I had to come back because of the Hollywood writers and the now actor strike. So I'm on mm -hmm. hold. Anytime mm -hmm. that phone rings, the strikes have been resolved. Yeah. I'm in the next flight. So, um, I mean, you, you've been on, on Black Panther. I mean, there's so many. Lion King. I was so happy to see you on Meta Mystery 2. I was on a plane. I didn't know. Um, and I'm watching and I see these big stars and I see our big star, <laughs> this global big star. And I'm, I was so excited. I mean, Captain America, etc. What is it like um, in, in Hollywood? Like, what was your, for instance, your, let's say your trailer in Hollywood look like when you're doing, let's say, Captain America? Look, and how I, different is it from here when you're doing a, a movie here in South Africa? It's a big business. The, the, if a movie is 300 million, close to 20% of that is marketing. Uh. and publish of this project. Mm. So when you get a conversation with the producers, are you in social media, Dr. Kane? I said, yes, okay. They're trying to see how many followers, how many people that mm. follow you. Mm. Are you on Instagram? Are you on, on, are you on, on Facebook? Are you on Twitter? Mm. Because that 160,000 that follow you are the direct marketing tool mm. to guarantee your followers. And they do also a stretch analysis, a movie or a play with John Carney. How many people would be expected mm. who knows his work since the 70s and all? They can quantify that. We have about, let's say, 300,000. And then we go to Adam Sandler. Sandler has about 6.2 million followers. Then we go to Jennifer Aniston. Then we go to Mark Strong. You complete that estimation. Then the movie is paid for in your first release. Mm. And in America, there are 5,000 master copies on the opening night across America. I don't open in PE, and then I go to Deben, and then I go to King Williamstown, then I go to Joburg. You know, it doesn't happen like that. It opens in one day. By the time you hate the movie, they've made 39 million. <laughs> they've already made, <laughs> they've already made their money. they already made their money. So when you walk into Hollywood, it's, it's like, man, it's like going to a boardroom with the people who run Prime Media. Mm. You know that I'm being called to the desk. <laughs> asking me questions and I have to prove myself there's that little flutter in your heart but then you say come on you picked up the phone I didn't ask for this job mm -hmm. 
I don't audition, incidentally. I didn't ask for this job. You called me. There must be something that you want from me. Yeah. And if you think you want me to deliver, I can. I know. Incidentally, I can act, Clement. <laughs> I can deliver. So that's the moment. Now you come to South Africa. Listen, man, John, we have this project. It's a project. You know, yeah. We have a project. Yeah, man. We this thing, you know, is about <laughs> this. And we, 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 are talking, we, we are talking to Netflix. We are talking to Kalahari. <laughs> we, 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 we are talking to... Nobody has a distributor. Yeah. We're talking, and, and this role you have, you know, it, it's so integral yeah. and, uh, about everything. To the bigger picture. To the bigger picture. And <laughs> if this one becomes a great success, John, we, we have another, a series of them coming. Yeah. It becomes a success and they get James L. Jones yeah. because now it's a success. Yeah. You see, and as Zakes Mugai used to say, you South Africans, someone says to you, I've got a project. You say, yes, yes. What is it about? Stop that. Say, how much is in it for me? How much are we talking about? Yeah. If the money is right, available. Have you ever said no to jobs you thought? A lot. That is not worth my time. A lot. I don't play boy. I don't play women and child abusers. I don't play any role that degenerates the dignity of a black man. Mm. I don't play any role that I don't believe is going to enhance my, 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 my craft and it's going to take my level and expose me to another level. Mm. I don't waste those times. Please get the younger ones to do that. When you know this is a major movie, my agent knows that, you know, that this is a blockbuster, then we can get him involved in it. Yeah. This is something. I, I don't waste time. I'm too old for playing hide and seek with little producers who got lot of money, but they think that the, the, the talent in this country <laughs> is the least yeah. considered when you put a budget together. And it's almost like building a the theater and mm. building a house, and you find that oh, we don't have toilets. Yeah. We didn't plan them. They're not in the major plan. Okay, mm. they can be in the corner, just mm. from the kitchen to a little extension there. Yeah. That's how they treat actors in this country. They've got a budget for everybody. Mm. And then when he says, okay, do you have a budget for actors? And suddenly, John wants 2.5 million on a three-week shoot. Nah. And then, but, but Signezi exposure. Uh, oh, hey, my should be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You should be a producer. <laughs> <laughs> 011-883-0702. <laughs> Uh, Clement, what what a living legend indeed. Yamchanda o you know, his storytelling it's in him, it's in his blood. I can listen to him the whole day, honestly. Uh, just please ask him if he is planning to do um, the, the 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 play for uh, on the book um, that he he was interviewing a, an author about, the trial of. Um, Rhodes, John Rhodes, I think is the title published by Jakana. I would love to see that book, you know, done into a play. Thank you so much. Hi, K. Hi, K. Clement Manyatella. You hi, 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 hi. You know, I've postponed my staff meeting twice now, ne? just because I can't get enough of the Dr. Gani. Now my team is not happy with me. I have to go to the office and uh, and start with our staff meeting. She goodness. This man, I know Clement, you really have elevated yourself. Sharon Shabalala, my friend, lovely. Dr. Kanye, we love you dearly, dearly. And God bless you with many more fruitful years. Hey, Clement, good morning. You know, there you are talking to a legend. A man I respect a lot. And and Dr. John Kanye, we are so proud of you to, to be part of the South African soil. And, and what you are doing. Thank you so much. We we love you. Thank you so much, uh, Clement, for hosting this, this legend. Daniel here in Laizonia. Thank you. Ah, thank Laizonia you and Century. Cheers. Thank you for the WhatsApp voice note. Uh, the trial of John Rhodes. Yes. Is that going to be in theater anytime soon? Is what, that a plan? What I did, I, I took the atrocities perpetrated by uh, King Leopold in the Congo Republic, mm. which actually with the rubber, <laughs> rubber b b b b industry and the copper, which was part of the electrification of the industrial revolution in Europe, mm -hmm. people were tortured there. He's killed over 25 million black people. Mm. So I made that as a trial mm -hmm. uh, together with Lisa Job and uh, what you call Robert Whitehead. 
And I played a lawyer said I would have loved to have uh, charged this guy because yeah. every time you go to the ICC, it's our leaders. You know, it's all black leaders. So this time I had uh -huh. King Leopold charging him for the atrocities and crimes against humanity. Then this professor comes to me, says to me, I've written something brilliant, the trial of Cecil John Rhodes. And he's been asking me if I could do something about mm. it. Uh, let it simmer in my subconscious. And when it comes as something that seems needs my urgent attention, mm. then it will happen. I do not get commissioned to write. You can ask me to act and pay me, but you can't commission me to mm. write. Because writing is an evolving natural process. Ah. Oh, I'm an artist. Natalie, you're calling us from Centurion. Hi. Hi, uh, this is Natalie, a.k.a. Angela. Uh, many years ago, I was a student at Cambridge University, and um, I was walking from my classes, uh, minding my own business. Um, I hadn't seen black people in, in weeks, if not months. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I hear, uh, no, 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 in, in, in Tswana. Somebody said it in Tswana, and, and, and somebody responded in Zulu. Um, and they said, no, man, there's, there's, these legs... Uh, mm. This must be South African. Yeah. So I cracked up laughing uh, because it was the last thing I, I expected. And then the next thing I turned around, it was Dr. Kani himself uh, and uh, yeah. Dawi and one other actor. Yeah. So so we became friends. And mm. yeah, I thought if that was one of the most beautiful moments for me wow. in particular. Wow, yeah. that's beautiful. Let me, let me tell you a story about Cambridge. Yeah. You know Stephen Hawkins, yeah. the great scientist. Mm. Now, I've just started to play with Rapulana Sepimo my children in Africa, in uh -huh. Cambridge. Uh -huh. And this lady comes backstage and says, excuse me, sir, Dr. Skoskins would like to say thank you to you. Uh -huh. Well, there were steps leading to the dressing room. I said, well, you can come up. And uh, <laughs> I'm a star. Who's the hell is Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, it would be slightly difficult for him <laughs> to do that. I said, okay, let him wait. I'm changing. Uh -huh. I'm not aware with who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. I put my clothes and I walk down. And they sit on that wheelchair and says, yeah. oh, my God, it's him, uh. Stephen Hawkins, the scientist, the man of matter and explosion in space. And he says, typing it there, says, uh. I understand that you told my nurse uh. that I it must come up, must come <laughs> up the stairs to see you. <laughs> yes, John, you are a star. I will follow you anywhere. Uh. But as you can see, I would not be able to do <laughs> that. And then he types, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I'm so embarrassed. I said, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I am terribly sorry. Uh, sir, I'm sorry. He said, I know. I, because she didn't say yeah. professor or scientist Stephen Hawkins. She says, yeah. Mr. Hawkins. It could Mr. be anyone. Um, what's next, Mr. Kani? Well, Danga, I've just now um, finished uh, this other part. I still have to finish the movie. Mm which I'm doing with uh, Walt Disney as soon as the strike is over. I'm also planning a tour of Kunen and the King. Yes. It's, it's doing the UK, mm -hmm. and then it's going to do America and Canada. And then when I'm back, uh, that will be the spring 2025, 2024, <laughs> I'm doing. Is that how far booked you are? Like, yeah. you are booked years in advance? Yes. Like, you know projects you're doing in the next, like, four yes. years? Oh, yes, uh, yes. Like, you're, you're not unemployed over the next five years. I mean, I'm 80 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I be stupid looking for work? <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, these are things that are arranged by the... You, you, your yeah. agent sorts them out, reads scripts. The MLA, Nashoda Billy, is incredible. She reads and says, excuse me, Dr. Kant, not available. Uh -huh. What it actually means, nah, it's not good enough. And then we uh -huh. set out, and then we say, okay, what's the schedule? And then they say, somebody wants to do a movie. We've just done a movie called Beyond the... Beyond the light barrier, mm -hmm. and I could fit it in the four week space before I came back to do this. Mm -hmm. So I could do such things that okay, this is going to be a short sort of a, a sort of shooting for me. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. But the major ones that are the pillars of my career and that keep me going are already established. That you're doing this from the October, November, December to March 2024. There's a break there, and then you're doing this from 2020, 2025, mm -hmm. right up to about September, October, November, December. So if a major project comes, we're looking at the end of 2025. Sure. My goodness. Well. 
thank you so much for making time for us in your busy schedule um, for coming to spend uh, an hour with us. We appreciate you. Uh, we are so proud of you and you inspire us so much. I finally uh, made Kanye. it. I'm famous. I'm on the Clement Magnatella show. No, we are famous <laughs> because Don Gani <laughs> came to the Clement Magnatella show. I made it. Thank you, Tata. Yabulela with my brokenness closer. Uh, but how do you say siak appreciate in closer? Siak what? Au, se obuka msebenzwa. Se obuka msebenzwa. Se obuka wakonda. Hanging out with Clement on 702. Let's walk the talk.